I inform the Senate that at 8.30am today, 27 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator McKim proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown on item 11 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I call Senator Hanson-Young. to this important debate today. Um, last week, the Productivity Commission released an interim report into the national water reform. This is a damning assessment of the state of Australia's water supply and water security. But of course, the Productivity Commission, being the economic conservative body that it is, has taken a very rational approach to what is a looming crisis right here in Australia. And the Productivity Commission has nailed the issue that climate change, a warming climate, more extreme weather events and the destruction of our environment is putting our water supply at risk. Within our rivers, our streams, our water catchments and the water supply for our towns and our cities. Now, of course, when the Productivity Commission raises such important issues, you have to turn and wonder who is in charge. Well, we know who is in charge of Australia's federal water policy. It's the National Party. And that's because, of course, the deal that was done to form the Morrison government was to ensure that the water portfolio was given to a member of the National Party. Now think about this. The party who doesn't accept the climate science doesn't even believe that we need to do what the science is requiring to reduce pollution, to, target, to tackle climate change, is in charge of the very important portfolio that is impacted most by the drying climate. The National Party, with their head buried in the sand, on climate change is putting Australia's Order. water supply Order. at risk. Order. Australia's water security is threatened by climate change and it is hanging in the balance because of, of the climate denialism inside the National Party and those at the helm of Australia's water policy. We've got a Murray-Darling Basin that is in crisis. It is oversubscribed. The extraction levels are so big that there is not enough water in the system to keep all of the users sustainable. There's not enough water in the system to keep the river flowing from A to B. In fact, we have towns right now in New South Wales, like Wilkenya, that don't have enough water to drink. And of course, this issue gets worse and worse and worse, not just because of the drying climate, but because those further upstream who are allowed to siphon off water that would have run into the system when indeed it does rain. So on one hand, we've got climate denialism overarching in the National Party and in this government, and then we've got a corrupt system of mismanagement of the scarce amount of water that is there. So we've got cotton farmers, cotton farmers in the north harvesting flood water. Meanwhile, meanwhile, towns further downstream don't even have enough clean water to drink, let alone to irrigate crops. Now I tell you what. You can't Senator eat. Hanson -Young, I have you can't Senator eat Pat cotton, and you certainly can't. Senator Hanson Young, I have Senator Patrick on his feet. Uh, Point thank of order. you, Madam Deputy President. I'm actually struggling to hear Senator Hanson Young because of Senator McKenzie's interjections. I ask that uh, okay, you remind. Okay, uh, I, I thank you, Senator out. Patrick. Stop I do. I do note that there is considerable level of noise in the in the chamber. So, um, 
if we could please uh, respect Senator Hanson Young as she finishes her contribution. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Look, the squawking from this corner of the room. Senator Sands, Port of Order, Senator Mackenzie. Well, I, I really think that's uh, poor language by the senator reflecting on another senator um, and saying they're squawking. I think uh, is not unparliamentary, Senator Hanson. Senator Hanson Young, sorry. So just, I'll just rule on that. It's, it's, the general discussion was a general; it wasn't at one person. So I'll, I'll, it's not a point of order at, at this occasion. So Senator Hanson Young to continue. The National Party over here in this corner are carrying on because they know the truth. They know that there is not enough water in the Murray-Darling Basin to ensure that towns and small farmers and the environment can survive because they of course have allowed their they have allowed their political interests to siphon off to harvest and to take all the water so that the rest of us are left with nothing and now we hear from the productivity commission that this is going to be made even worse because of climate change. Now, if we want to get this right, if we want to secure Australia's water supply, we've got to get rid of the nationals from running this portfolio. If Mr Morrison, as Prime Minister, is serious about the future of this country, he has to dump the National Party from holding the, the strings on Australia's water supply. Senator Davey. Look, thank you. And, you know, the water portfolio, you, you say it like it's a gift to the nationals, but the water portfolio Order. is a poison chalice. Order. It is the poison chalice of all portfolios because it is the one portfolio Order. in our nation. Do you Greens want it? That would be great because the green solution is to just add water. That's all the Greens can think about when it comes to managing our environment and managing our waterways. Just add water. Miraculously, it rains and well, Kenya's got water. I wish I could make, make it rain. I wish I could make it rain. And I wish that we could stop taking water and still feed ourselves and still clothe ourselves. Would that not be good, Senator Patrick? And you know the same can be said for your irrigators, who are fantastic irrigators. South Australian irrigators are very good. New South Wales irrigators are good. We need our irrigation industry. We absolutely need our irrigation industry. It underpins our agricultural production. It underpins our regional communities and our regional economies. And it's these communities and economies who have been absolutely devastated by the just add water approach that the Greens cling to time and time again. I want to remind this chamber what our communities have given in the name of the environment. And it goes way back. Let's talk about the early 90s when communities in Victoria and New South Wales gave up their right to some water in the name of the environment with the very first environmental water allocation, the Barma Miller Forest allocation. They gave that water up with no compensation. Then again in the late 90s, the cap on diversions was put in place. And again, our communities gave up water with no compensation in the name of the environment. Fast forward to the 2000s and we got a National Party minister, and good on him. John Anderson did the right thing. He recognised water as a property right. He developed the National Water Initiative, which the Greens are now holding up as the doyen for water reform. Thank you, National Party, because if it wasn't for the National Party, that water initiative would not have been signed in place and the Productivity Commission report wouldn't exist. So thank you to the National Party for that. And that is not the only reform the National Party have led. I know I have uh, my colleague and friend, Senator Patrick, over there, who doesn't believe that the National Party have made any steps when it comes to water compliance. And that could not be further from the truth. It was the National Party in New South Wales who have implemented the Natural Resource Access Regulator, who is now held up as the Order. compliance cop on the beat in the basin. The, the National Party 
has led the way in developing modern telemetric technology to apply to on-farm water storages so that we can manage what we, we can measure what we manage when it comes to water. We in, the, in New South Wales and Victoria have had telemetered and compliant meters for years since the early 90s and in fact in my area of Murray irrigation we have had uh, volumetric caps on our entitlements and metered take since the 60s. So uh, for people down at the south end of the system to stand on a soapbox and try and claim purity when in their districts up until two years ago they were allowed to take water with no water in their account. They were the only jurisdiction left in the Murray-Darling Basin that even under national water initiative compliant entitlement regimes were allowed to access water when they didn't have it in their account, effectively manipulating the market, going into the market after the fact when prices were cheaper instead of, like every other state in the basin, having to have a positive account balance. I mean, imagine. It's like having water on a credit card. It should not happen, and thankfully and congratulations, South Australia have taken steps to amend that. But for other South Australians to stand on a soapbox and point the finger, don't throw stones in glass houses. I also uh, you know, want to remind people that the Greens hold this up and say the Nationals shouldn't have the portfolio because we deny climate change. I've never denied climate change. My colleagues don't deny climate change. But you can't make all policy— Order. Sorry. But also, let's, let's look at this. They say that because it is good for their constituents and to blame someone else like the Nationals for being denialists, it's good for their constituents. But their constituents don't bear the brunt of the reforms that have been done in the name of the environment over years. Those regional communities that have been put through the ringer, who are still living in perpetual uncertainty about what water regime they will be living under and whether there will be enough water remaining in their region to enable effective and efficient and affordable water management. Because you can't do it alone. Because let's talk about the progress of water reform and what it has actually cost. Forget about the cost for the taxpayer. What about the cost in our communities? In the Edward Wall Call system, 50 per cent of their water entitlements have been recovered under the name of the environment. 50 per cent. Imagine trying to run a, a store by being told you're only allowed to put 50 per cent worth of stock in that store, but you've still got the same costs and the same overheads. It doesn't work. The dairy industry in the Murray region, which includes Victoria, has been de decimated by water reform since the 2000s. It has been ongoing and uh, it has declined 40 per cent since the turn of this century during the peak of the water reform frenzy. <coughs> and while our remaining dairy farmers are absolutely pulling their weight and keeping Australian dairy going, there is no doubt that they are in pain. Our rice industry, the most efficient rice industry, water efficient rice industry in the world, is on its knees because of the impact on the water market that water reform has had. This is the water market that the Productivity Commission says has significant net benefits. So I'm not saying the water market is a bad thing, but look at the cost of reform. We can't keep exporting our problems. We cannot say just grow rice overseas. Grow rice overseas in third world countries that need to feed themselves. Grow rice overseas in countries that use triple the amount of water, which is a precious resource everywhere in the world. 
grow rice overseas where they may or may not use child labour, where their chemical regimes are far more questionable than Australia's? No. We've got to take responsibility for our own nation and our own production. And I also remind people that rice can be turned off and on. So think about that next time you're choosing between rice milk or almond milk when you're ordering your latte. Almonds use more water than rice per hectare every year yeah. without fail. Yeah. Yeah. Rice can be grown when it's wet, not grown when it's dry. Rice is the perfect crop for our variable climate. And finally, we want to talk about climate change. Seriously, water reform and climate change? Well, let's talk about the lower lakes. Let's talk about the impact of rising sea levels on the barrages and the lower lakes. Order. Order. Take away the dams. Senator Patrick, if you would like to take away the dams, congratulations. You bring that argument upstream. And I am not. What I am saying, Senator Patrick, and I'm not saying get rid of the barrages, I've never said that. What I am saying is that the barrages, as they currently exist and operate, will be compromised by rising sea levels. Thanks to climate change, the conversation needs to be had about how we manage the lower lakes and the barrages to address that instead of just looking upstream saying, just add more. It has to stop. Senator Ayres. Well, any Australian listening to this would despair uh, and reach the conclusion that the Greens of the National Party can't be trusted with water policy. I have to say, listening to Senator Davies' account, she speaks with some authority, I think, on questions around southern New South Wales and the rice industry, and I respect her contribution in that area. The truth is the National Party's administration of water policy, though, has let the people in the southern part of the river system down. The truth is that the National Party is institutionally incapable of administering water policy at the federal and state level in a way uh, that deals with the environmental questions in the river, that deals with the water usage questions for agriculture and, in particular, uh, deals appropriately with the rights of native title holders along the river. I listened carefully to the Closing the Gap report yesterday. I have to say I was horrified again by one particular political party's approach uh, to those issues, but I guess I'll save that for another day. And I was considering, as we were listening to the Closing the Gap report, uh, what that meant in terms of water policy in western New South Wales, because the uh, issues around uh, the gap are nowhere more apparent than in terms of the way that we deal with water, particularly water in New South Wales. Aboriginal communities and corporations own just 0.1 per cent of the more than $26 billion worth of water entitlements in the system. I travelled to these communities. I visited Wilcannia during the drought where the Barkindji people have lived next to the river for millennia. Life expectancy for Wilcannia men is 37.5 years. I visited the Brewarrina fish traps, believed to be the oldest human structure on earth. It should be a national monument. They are about 10 times as old as the pyramids. They were bone dry. I visited Walgett and talked to local health services. When the town runs dry, <clears throat> and it was dry then, the consequences for people's health and kids' health is catastrophic. Drinking less water, bathing less frequently, eating less nutritious food. It's a town that already has endemic health issues concentrated in the town's Aboriginal communities. And the truth is, while I heard the refrain from those members, those senators in the National Party that we just needed it to rain, the truth is the arrival of rain has not solved these problems. In January, Menindee's water supply, its drinking water, turned green. A thick slime now covers a third of its surface. It's despite the fact that northwest New South Wales has received twice as much rain 
as 2018 and 2019 combined. Water management is a complex set of problems, but what it requires beyond the framework is a rigorous approach to compliance, to dealing with corruption and to dealing with powerful lobbies and interest groups. Because the truth is that the people who miss out, who have missed out under the national stewardship of water policy, are farmers all along the river. It's the environment that's missed out. It's the people in the towns who should have good, decent jobs coming out of Australian agriculture, and it is certainly native title holders or prospective native title holders along the system. Now, last week, the New South Wales Irrigators Council found that inflows have almost halved over the past 20 years, consistent with climate change projections. That availability will get worse. Now, the Nationals don't have a plan for water, and no more evident in that is I'll take the interjection from Senator Canavan to build more dams. These jokers haven't built a dam. They haven't built a dam for decade Order. after decade after decade. Put aside, put aside whether or not that would be a good idea. There's plenty of private sector unregulated dams Order. out there, but you guys haven't built a dam. Big talk about the dams. Every regional, every regional newspaper, there's always some joker from the National Party saying, we're going to be Order. out there, we're going to build a dam. Do they ever build one? They announce and they never deliver. They announce and they never deliver. Over and over and over again, these characters sell out the people of country New South Wales and country Australia. Now, it does invite, I think, a broader consideration of the issues facing Australian agriculture, a political movement that once purported to represent country-minded thinking has become a political front for a very narrow set of interests. The big questions, the big questions about Australian agriculture, as we rebuild from a record drought, now it's the time for a big debate about building a stronger future for Australian agriculture. This year, the national Order. cattle herd fell to 24.6 million. Australia's sheep flock fell to 66 million, the lowest level since 1985. 1905. And these characters mumble about nuclear power and building dams, no substantial solutions. Now, the government, the government has set the goal for Australian agriculture to be exporting $100 billion by 2030. The government set that goal because the National Farmers Federation set that goal. Now, that is a good goal for the National Farmers Federation to have. But the question has to be asked, is it the right goal for the country? In truth, it lacks ambition. The truth is that Australian agriculture has continued to fall down the global value chain. It's fine for the National Farmers Federation to set an objective for farmers about farm gate prices and volumes, but the truth is we should be having a big debate in this country if we're really interested in the people who live and work or want work in country towns, we should be focused on a debate about creating value in Australian agriculture, about adding value, about food manufacturing. And where is the National Party on these questions? They are nowhere. They are nowhere. In terms of climate change and agriculture, where is the National Party? the poor old National Party, they are nowhere. Uh, the party that purports to represent the communities that will be most affected is nowhere on climate change policy, completely missing. Net zero emissions endorsed by every key agriculture body. Poor old, poor old Mr Joyce, the member for New England, said a net zero emissions policy would destroy any hope of expanding Australian farming. If the Nationals supported net zero emissions, we would cease to be a party that could credibly represent farmers. Well, here is what the peak body for cattle farmers said in their Red Meat 2030 plan. We will play a role. We will play our role in reducing Australia's greenhouse gas emissions by extending our existing commitment to carbon neutrality by 2030 across the supply chain. The National Farmers Federation are there. Everybody in agriculture is there. 
Where is the National Party? Nowhere. They have already, already ceased to have any claim to credibly represent Australian agriculture or Australian farmers. Now we Order. will, we will uh, bring to the next election a credible platform in agriculture. This parliament should be debating the big issues about the future of Australian agriculture. You know, in no small part, one of the key issues facing Australian agriculture is the lack of research in Australian agriculture. Research funding in Australian agriculture has collapsed year after year after year. The small increase in private funding in, uh, re research increases is completely dwarfed by the collapse in government funding. And guess who's in charge of government funding for Australian agriculture? The truth is private sector research delivers short-term benefits, but public sector research into the big challenges for Australian agriculture delivers long-term benefits. And you would think that the National Party had nothing to do with the government. There is, there is a complete collapse Order. in research funding for Australian agriculture, and these guys, again, nowhere to be seen. So if you've got an interest in the future of the river system, if you've got an interest in sustaining communities along the river and sustaining uh, Australian agriculture along the river, if you've got a concern about the future of Australian agriculture and lifting it up the value chain and increasing jobs in country towns, don't go to the National Party for solutions. Senator Patrick. Um, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President. I, uh, I rise to, to speak on the uh, MPI today, which uh, goes to concerns about the National Party ever having too much about uh, water. Let's go back to the start of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, where uh, sensible decisions were made to uh, introduce an act to manage, to manage the, the, uh, the Murray-Darling Basin uh, and to do so in a manner uh, where we establish what the environmental uh, uh, sustainable le level of take was by best available science. Best available science. And a 726-page document was produced by the Murray-Darling Basin Authority showing that the right number for, um, uh, in terms of the, the uh, amount of water we had to recover was somewhere between uh, 3,900 gigalitres and 7,600 gigalitres. Now, uh, of course, there was debate about uh, how much uh, uh, we, uncertainty we were going to allow in the recovery of water to make sure the river was healthy, but unfortunately there was political interference, political interference from the nationals. And in fact, uh, one of the people suggesting this number was so wrong is the current uh, Inspector General, Acting Inspector General, who uh, went on record and said, no, it's, it, it shouldn't be uh, uh, it shouldn't be uh, 7,600. It shouldn't be 3,900. We're going to go even lower. It shouldn't even be 2,750, which is what what ultimately uh, uh, the political number was. He wanted it to be 2,100. He's on record as suggesting it ought to be 2,100. So uh, this is the Inspector General, that is a, a former New South Wales uh, Deputy Premier, Premier, National Party member, appointed by a National Party. Minister in this government, what does that do for confidence in uh, in the plan? So, of course, uh, the nationals don't, are not concerned about lawfulness when uh, when we look at the river, and uh, I'm I'm a, bit, a little bit surprised that uh, Senator McKenzie hasn't stood up. Uh, Senator McKenzie, SC, hasn't stood up, having won the, lots of High Court challenges, uh, and maybe uh, tried to. Uh, uh, contest what uh, Brett Walker SC uh, said in the Royal Commission, and that is that the plan is unlawful. It's, it's unlawful because of the Nationals' interference in uh, determining what the appropriate SDLs ought to be. And then we go back to having got the plan, having got an unlawful plan, they still want to take uh, 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 more water from the river. They still want to take more water from the river. The National Party's talk about let's pray for rain. It's not about that. We know what the rainfall is. We know the, infl the inflows are reduced. The problem is you're taking too much water. 
And funnily enough, Senator McKenzie pretends to represent irrigators. I've been to the Southern, um, uh, to Southern River. Well, you, might, you might live there. Well, how about the people that, that are there that can't take water as it goes past because there's no water coming Order. down? Senator no, because Patrick. there's no Senator water coming Patrick. down the Darling River. Senator Patrick, That's please why, do because Senator the nationals Patrick. have Order. turned on the. Senator Patrick. Senator Mackenzie, Senator Patrick, Senator Patrick, could you please direct your comments through the chair and not interjections are just disorderly. So, so we have a situation where the National Party uh, te uh, they, they, they talk about rain, blaming it on rain. It's not about rain. It's about taking too much water. Some of them think that uh, uh, we're letting the water roll down to the Murray mouth. Uh, and then letting it go, go to sea. Let me read what, uh, uh, what um, Richard Beasley said in his recent book. Several people involved in agriculture in the other basin states and some of the politicians they support consider any water that flows out of the Murray River to be an exercise in irrigating the Southern Ocean. These people are idiots. I think he got it right. Imagine a river that runs into the ocean. Imagine that. Now, uh, unfortunately, the nationals don't even understand that. They don't even understand that in order to, to have uh, water that is not saline, that, that uh, is usable in irrigation, you've got to have a healthy river system. But no, they continue to take, take, take. And they, they continue to stand in the way of the execution of the plan, uh, making silly water purchases that don't actually return anything to the environment and paying twice the toad odds. Order. Twice the toad odds. The National Party have corrupted the, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Senator Patrick, your time's expired. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you so much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Tell you what we won't take, Senator Patrick, through you, Madam Chair, is we will not take the carping from a South Australian senator, because it is our people, our people and our communities in the heart of the Murray-Darling Basin who have paid the price for the complicit arrangement between South Australian Order. senators in this chamber and in the other place. It is our people. The Murray-Darling Basin is an area that spans four states. Two million Australians live in the Murray-Darling Basin. And it is vastly productive in ter terms of food and fibre production. Now, you know what you can't do for these two million people and their communities and their industries? You can't keep them employed, keep them sustainable and prosperous without water, water without a triple bottom line approach Senate. to our irrigated agriculture. And what we have done as a political party and a movement that is very proud to stand up for these people and these industries the pe that actually brings their concerns. You pretend to bring their concerns, Senator Patrick. You don't know their concerns, Senator Hanson Young. But we live in these communities and we're very proud to bring their concerns here and to be reformers around water policy and also to deliver uh, for our communities. We are the political party that actually put people into the triple bottom line. Remember the triple bottom line was supposed to be uh, about humans, the environment and the economy. Well, you only hear about one side of the triple bottom line from the Greens and from Senator Alliance this, these days, or actually probably you throw South Australia in there as well. When you want to know why there's no water in the Murray-Darling Basin, it's because all heading south. And I stand here today, this chamber, has done over 10 Senate inquiries into the Murray-Darling Basin because it's not working. So the great con plan concocted with a, with a number pulled out of the air, a political solution, that number, no science to it, which has been prosecuted in estimates and in Senate inquiries ad nauseum over the last decade and is actually ripping apart rural communities in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. When we talk about why the National Party holds this policy, it's because we understand the implications of the policy intent. We have to deal uh, with the outcomes. And it is National Party ministers who decided to decentralise the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. So the people making decisions and implementing this plan actually had skin in the game. 
weren't bureaucrats in Canberra far away not understanding how their policy decisions and their implementation decisions were impacting real people, kids at school and the future sustainability of our communities. We actually are very proud to have been the political party that introduced the 1,500 gig uh, cap on water buybacks. That's actually good policy. We actually prioritise water infrastructure projects over this casual Order. disregard of coming into rural communities and buying back water Order. off willing sellers. Remember willing sellers? They were actually drought-affected farming communities and families that have been there for generations who had no other options. And the devastating impact of the Swiss cheese effect of those water buybacks in our communities that you, you weren't even here when this was happening, but it was absolutely horrific what has actually occurred and the channels that have had to close, etc., as a result of that. It's the National Party that, you know what, decided to conduct an investigation, Senator Patrick, into Order. the socio-economic impact of the plan on our people. Heaven forbid, heaven forbid that the National Party actually calls government to account and asks for an assessment of how this Labor Greens policy is impacting the people and the industries uh, that, that the Murray-Darling Basin uh, flows through. It's, it's the National Party that delivered a 605 gig reduction in water recovery to the Southern Basin through a package of six, 36 projects. It's the National Party that got the Productivity Commission report done. It's the National Party that protects water security, clean drinking uh, water and food supply through a raft of measures, including the Murray-Darling Communities Investment Package, which is amazing. We've strengthened governance of the plan. Uh, through our particular ministers, and I think it's absolutely fantastic that we've got an inspector general who's lived in the basin, who has a very a lived experience of what this is like. You know, we make no apology for the people for being the party that the people in the Murray Darling Basin choose to vote for. They don't vote for the Greens. If the Greens' policies were so fabulous for the Order. basin communities, why Order. don't they Senator hold a single seat? state or federal in any single basin community you know why you know why because your policies only float in a couple of places brunswick in my home state of victoria and the cbd of sydney order in the cbd of sydney we hold a water buybacks and chose to invest in on farm efficiency to actually help farmers um, deal with the impacts of a changing climate and seasonal variations they are on the front line they are changing practice each and every day in response to the high price of water because the South Australian and the New South Wales state governments will not stop developments in the southern region of the basin. That's what the National Party is calling for. Stop those uh, hungry, thirsty uh, almond tree developments at, which are driving the price of water up. The National Party is also calling to split the compliance functions of the MDBA away. I am very, very proud to be Senate leader of a party that takes its role in this place seriously, and its water ministers take their role seriously to perform and reform this area, which is so crucial. We are focused on delivering a triple bottom line. It's a pity the Greens and the Labor Party are no longer interested in Order. putting people at the centre of their policy. You're very happy for people to vote us to come here. It's about time you actually started remembering uh, that food and fibre production in this country is reliant on the human beings that till the soil in the communities we represent. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise today to speak on this urgency motion. And um, again, I'm speaking on an urgency motion drafted by the Greens to, as we as we've seen before, essentially trigger the nationals into delivering this type of performance art that we've seen uh, in the last couple of um, uh, speeches. The truth is, uh, it is a difficult motion to, to be directed at the nationals, I think takes out what is important about this debate. Uh, but we do know, we do know, fair enough, the nationals try to pick and choose when they're in government and when they're not. And I don't 
live in some of these communities that people have spoken about today. Um, not down south um, uh, in Adelaide or down in northern, uh, southern New South Wales. But it is an issue that deeply affects people in regional Queensland. And I know from living there that the Nationals like to run around and talk about the things that they uh, care about. But when they come down here, they forget to actually do the work to get the policies delivered. To do the work to get the policies delivered. They're very good, very good at turning up with some core flutes and some petitions and getting some media to come along Order. and to talk about Order. the things that they're going to do because they're in the National Party. But when they come down here, they're part of the Liberal National Party and they make sure that they are part of a government that continues to mismanage water and environment policy and all the things that actually matter to the people that they say that they represent. This productivity report slammed the Morrison government's management of water. And that's because it takes a commitment to deliver, not just to your own constituency, to, but everyone who relies on water. You can't deliver a policy that is just about delivering yourself an applause when you get back to where you're from. You've got to deliver a policy that supports everyone that relies on water and acknowledges the very real impacts that climate change is having on our environment in our rural regions and the impact that it is having on the very communities that the nationals say that they represent. What we know is that some of the big economic impacts in regions and in, the, in rural areas are some of the things that the Nationals and the Liberal government refuse to deal with and refuse to put a plan in place. Uh, we know that in uh, the water minister's own electorate, there are towns that have run out of water. And I'm not talking about a couple of weeks where they had to be restricted in the way that they were using water. They are trucking water in to the water minister's own electorate. And they have been doing that for years. For over 12 months now, water is being trucked in to the water minister's own electorate. And yet this report shows, this report shows, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, if the, if the Greens and Nationals want to take this outside, go ahead. But if you want to just give me a couple of seconds, I can, <laughs> possibly, Senator, but... Order, just please direct through this. Those here. communities in southern Queensland who have run out of water, deserve to be part of this conversation, deserve to have a local member and deserve to have a minister that will not just turn up for the photo op but actually deliver when he comes down to Canberra because right now that is not what is happening. And I just want to note that what this, rec what this uh, production, uh, Commission's advice says is very important, it's very crucial. It says that the overarching goal of the National Water Initiative remains sound but should be modernised through reference to the adaptation to climate change and the recognition of the importance of water in the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. That is imperative that our First Peoples are part of this conversation. And that's not what the Nationals come here to talk about. They do not... Order. They do not see this as something that affects every single person living on every single land in Queensland and New South Wales and down, down south to South Australia. They see, this, they see this as something for them to have in the Cabinet room you, but to do nothing time, with. Time has expired. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to contribute to this matter of public importance and I thank my colleague Senator McKim. May I remind everyone in this chamber, no one owns water. Nobody owns it. Nobody owns water. If anything, you've stolen it. You've stolen the water. Order. You've stolen the water. No one owns the water. You can't look after it. It's a mess. You are stealing it. This country, the earth, we say is our mother. 
You have to look after your mother, okay? Because if you don't, bad things will happen. Now, the water to our mother is the blood that runs through your, her veins. And you would know that, Senator McKenzie. You're a mother, and you know how important it is to Senator protect Thorpe. and respect your mother. So that's how we should be looking at water. And I know that's difficult for you to understand, Senator, over there with the face happening. But Excuse me, uh, Senator, uh, Senator Sen Thorpe, that's not appropriate. <laughs> Please direct your comments through the chair. I, I apologise and I take that back, but it is very, um, it's very close to my heart that a bunch of white people are talking about owning water and water rights and the monetary value to water. It's absolutely disgusting. It's disrespectful. And there is no, you didn't even mention for, no one's mentioned uh, First Nations people except for the Labor Party over here, and I respect order. that. So water to us is life. It is life. For our people, water is our song lines. There are stories to every waterways in this whole country. The whole country, there is a story about why they meet up to one another and how important they are to the people who have been on that part of the country for thousands and thousands and thousands of generations. I'm not going to sit here and listen to a bunch of white people telling me that they know more about the water in this country than the people that have been here for thousands of generations. Water is not about money. Water is about our life, your children's life, and it is fundamental to our people, to our survival. This continent has been our ancestral home for our people for over 70,000 years. Our people's relationship with the inland waters, rivers, wetlands, sea, in islands, reefs, sandbars and seagrass beds is part of who we are. This is why Article 25—and you might want to listen to this over here, the Nationals, because you could put it in some of your writings yourself—but Article 25 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People says that, and I quote, Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinctive spiritual relationships with their traditionally owned or otherwise occupied and used lands, territories, waters and coastal seas and other resources and to uphold their responsibilities to future generations in this regard. I mean, who's looking after our water for future generations? Certainly not this lot. Water for all of us but particularly for our people, is far too important to be left in the hands of the climate-denying nationals who can only think of water as a resource to be exploited for greed and total water. mismanagement. The coal-loving minister for resources, Keith Pitt, himself dismissed the climate warning issued by the United Nations by saying that grand statements are quite simple, simple to make. He is so triggered by anyone calling him a climate denier, and we see the other reactions today, that he even requested a parliamentary inquiry into lenders and insurers blacklisted companies linked to the coal and gas producers. You have to wonder who the nationals are actually for these days, because they're not even looking after the farmers. Farmers and traditional owners are joining forces. And they know that not even the nationals are protecting their interests. They're better off working with us. Farmers already know that climate change is costing them. Water is too important to be in the hands of climate deniers, who in our way would suggest they have no respect or understanding of water, and it should never be in any position to make decisions for such a sacred resource. That'll do. Senator Canavan. It's got to go around the chamber, mate. Um, I'll, I'll be. Senator Canavan, take a seat, please. Senator, Senator Wishaw. Yeah, ha on a having point of order. Senator point, Canavan, point, yeah, take point a of seat. order, Acting Deputy President. Um, there's a speaking list. Um, the next speaker is not here. I'm next on the list. I have no problems with Senator Canavan going after me and taking that last five-minute spot. But you should check with the clerk. But I should be the next person who gets the call. <laughs> Sorry, take your seat, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator McKenzie. The convention in this chamber is to rotate the call. I could have.
I, and the standing orders. And also, my understanding is this is an informal agreed list, um, given Senator Roberts isn't here, and the call should come to this side of the chamber. Uh, it should be Senator Canavan that gets the call. Senator Wish oh, sorry, Senator Canavan, on that point of order. No, no sorry. Okay. Okay. On the point of order, I'm going to rule on the basis that the, the list has fallen apart during the course of the session because we haven't got Senator Roberts. Here. So I'm going to call Senator Canavan as he was the next person on his feet, which is the, the usual um, thing. So Senator Canavan has the call. Note that we are not taking any more time for the Nationals Party than was agreed. Senator Mackenzie did cut her time, um, so we're not seeking at all to deny other senators their appropriate times. Um, I, I just wanted to add some quick uh, thoughts on this motion, and particularly something I don't think that has been mentioned during this debate is that I, as an Australian, am incredibly proud about what we have built as a nation in the Murray Darling. There's been very little mention of the hard work, the pioneering effort that went into building the farms, the dams that feed us today, that actually feed us and provide 40 per cent of our nation's food. We would, we would really be in serious trouble, as much trouble as the early settlers, if we didn't have the Murray Darling here in Australia. And we should recognise the sweat, the toil, uh, the desperation that many people before us went through to get that to happen. I heard Senator Patrick say before, let's just get rid of the dams. Let's just get rid of the dams, as if, as if that would mean nothing for the rest of the country. What, how would we feed ourselves? How would we uh, be able uh, to provide for other people in this country? And I think it's very important that we mention and recognise that one of the key things we want to achieve out of the management of the Murray-Darling is the production of food, is the creation of viable rural communities. Uh, they're not constantly under the threat of having their economic base pulled from out or under them. And what the Nationals Party, my Senate leader, Senator McKenzie, summed it up well before, what the Nationals Party have brought back to this debate is people. We've brought back people to the heart of this debate, people uh, are on a farm who are, who, who are trying to keep uh, a farm in their family in, over generations, people who own a cafe. In, in Wagga Wagga. And if you ever get to go to Wagga Wagga, it's one of the best bakeries in, in this country, I think. Beautiful restaurants. Those people deserve to have a future. The people, the people in the cities who want to eat all the food they see on MasterChef or the latest reality TV show, those people uh, are important as well. And also the Indigenous people of the system as well. And it was the Nationals Party who introduced a $40 million fund to buy back water for Indigenous people, because I know, meeting many Indigenous people through the basin, that they too want to develop their own farms and economic opportunities and potentially use water as well. And, and I, I, uh, I think it's very important in this debate that we represent that whole country, from the rural community, from the farmer, right through to the dinner plate in the urban environment. And it's the National Party that does have representatives right across the Murray-Darling. And again, I, I, sometimes in this debate, when you hear people say, let's blow up the barrages, or let's blow up Cubby Station, or let's blow up Menindee Lakes, we have to manage it as a system. There is not one single answer. There is not one thing you can do which will solve all of the issues. It must be balanced in a respectful way that puts people at the heart of this debate, because ultimately we all have an interest in seeing a strong, viable and sustainable Murray-Darling that can continue to feed us long into the future. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I have no problems with Canavan, Senator Canavan having a contribution here, uh, but I notice he studiously avoided even mentioning the Productivity Commission report, the agency he used to work for before he came in the Senate. And I also note that he made no comment at all about climate change. But he's been very vocal, Acting Deputy President. He's been very vocal on the national stage in the last week. He just said recently. Under no circumstances would I support any 2050 climate plan. Under no circumstances would I support climate action. He also said that regional towns in this country, including the Murray-Darling Basin, quote unquote, face complete destruction, complete destruction under net zero emissions policy. Well, let me tell you why these towns will face complete destruction in the next 100 years, it's because of the National Party and their climate denial. Because of the National Party and this government. It will be because of record heat waves. It will be because of drought, fire, flood, pestilence. And we'll lose more farmers. 
to suicide. That's because this party that purports to represent farming and rural and regional communities in this country has completely let them down because they're in here, in this place, playing culture war games, playing politics. What policy have they put up to help farmers? What policy have they put up to tackle climate change? Well, Mr Littleproud in the other place this week said, ah, 2050, yeah, that might work for us. But he said, I want to see a plan first. This is the guy that has the agricultural portfolio. Why hasn't he developed a plan? What has he been doing for the last five years that he's been at the helm? It begs the question, what have any of them been doing? Five years. But this government has sat on eight years of climate inaction. They have ripped up every policy that was in this place to act on climate change. And they've cost farmers big revenue. They're not only the costs that farmers face of climate inaction. Order. Abe has recently said that farmers have lost more than a billion dollars because of climate change inaction. But we know that removing the carbon price and the carbon farming initiative has cost farmers big time. They could be selling their excess abatement credits in the UK market and the EU market right now at $50 a tonne. Instead, they're facing down the barrel of spending, having to pay $50 a tonne of carbon on our exports, their agricultural exports. That's the genius of this mob. The genius of this mob. And may I say, in relation to Senator Thorpe's contribution in here, a very moving, beautiful contribution. Everyone in this chamber, we've been here, what, nearly two decades on this planet? And I take it we're all connected to our land in our own ways. Two decades. Maybe the odd MP or senator might have been in, in their third decade in this place. Imagine being part of a culture that was here for not 20 decades or even 200, but 2,000. 2,000 generations living on this land. If we can't learn from our first Australians about how to live in harmony with this land, then we are totally stuffed. What have we managed to do in just eight generations? That's how long white people have been in this land. Eight generations. What have we managed to do? We've completely managed to stuff the Murray-Darley Basin. Millions of dead fish just last year. How, how easily we forget millions of dead fish. And no one was more angered and appalled and saddened than farmers when they saw that. What else have we managed to do? Half the barrier reef is dead. And so on and so forth. I'd need another 20 minutes, Acting Deputy President, to go through how badly we have managed country since we have arrived here and colonised and invaded this country. And I'm really peeved that these guys continue to come in here and act as though they care about farmers when they don't. Thank you, Senator Wishwolf. So the question is that the urgency motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Against say no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. The ayes have it. Is there a division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is, the urgency motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Ciccone, tell her for the ayes, and Senator Brockman, tell her for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 30. The votes being equal, the matter is therefore resolved in the negative.